coming up on Theatre Talk. Theater is not the written play, and it's not a film of the play, and it's not any other, it's, it's that thing that happens on that night right. that you're part of. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. about you. Richard was so upset. Were you, Richard? Hey. In all the time we'd been together, I'd never seen him so upset. How long is that? Three months? <laughs> Almost four. Anyway, he was so scared you'd be maimed or brain damaged Honey. or something. I found myself going, please, God, Richard <clears throat> loves Sarah so much. Please don't let her die. Honey, you're hurting my hand. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. Donald Margulies is one of our favorite writers. He's given us some really terrific plays over the years. Dinner with Friends, a particular favorite of mine called What's Wrong with This Picture? And I'm very pleased that he's back on Broadway with a terrific new play called Time Stands Still about a war photographer who's been injured in a battle zone and has come back to New York to try to make some sense of her life. Uh, I'm delighted the play brings Donald Margulies back to Theatre Talk. Welcome. Thank you, Michael. Susan. And the play has a terrific cast. Uh, Laura Linney, Brian Darcy James, Alicia Silverstone, and Eric Bogosian, who also happens to be a pretty good writer himself. Welcome to Theatre Talk for the Thank first you. time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Donald, what got you thinking about um, a war correspondent at the center of your play? You know, I, my plays usually come from a, 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 what I call a troub troubled place. And I found that uh, the conversations that I was having with friends dinner with friends, if you will, mm -hmm. um, focused on the world, which we do if we are moral, thinking, feeling people. And uh, I began to formulate a story. I've always been interested in journalism and photojournalism in particular. Years ago, I, I wrote a movie for Oliver Stone about Robert Kappa that never got made. <laughs> but I immersed myself in the research, and I, I was fascinated by him as a figure. And as this play began to take shape, I, I was thinking of a way to write about things that were on our collective mind, mm -hmm. but not to have it so close to current events that it would make it dated, but to really just deal with sort of the gestalt of what's going on in our society right now in terms of people struggling to live a moral life given the enormity of, of the world's ills. So the character of Sarah just sort of emerged uh, and the, the cast of characters began to take form for me in this loft that I imagined. In Williamsburg? Yes, a Williamsburg, Brooklyn loft yeah. is where it takes place. And you're brought into the play, Eric, as um, Sarah's photo editor at a magazine sort of much like Vanity Fair, I guess. You know, or the Sunday Times magazine. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Um, and how did you get involved in the play when you were, are you and Donald friends and sort of an idea you had to, to bull him into it? Ooh. Donald and I had been friendly. Uh, we were up at Williamstown together at one point, and uh, I'm also friendly with other people who are, in, particularly uh, uh, Dan Sullivan, the director. Uh, unbeknownst to Donald, I think uh, I had found Dinner with Friends extremely trenchant, and it had made a big impact on me mm -hmm. as a play and as a topic of discussion. Um, they asked, actually, it was, I mean, I was asked to come by and just read some lines to help everybody out one afternoon. I do this often with plays and but now you know I'm the theory is is that I'm always too busy to be doing anything so I'll come by on a Monday and do it and so I did it. I, I love the people at Manhattan Theatre Club and um, I came by and read it and a couple hours later somebody called and said do you want to do it <laughs> and I said and uh, I had already now I had been in contact with the cast members because we'd done the reading together and I had now <clears throat> uh, gotten to know Laura, Brian, and Alicia a little better and I thought, wow, what a nice bunch of people. I mean, how pleasurable would this be mm -hmm. to do this? Also, the character just, it felt right right away. Yeah, well, and, we have to um, say the character is interesting for you because uh, we were saying before we started taping that people expect you to come on the stage and, you know, knock some heads around. But right. this is actually a, a sensitive, decent kind of guy. Well, playing. he's the mensch. You know, yeah. he, he is, he is the, the voice of menschiness. 
Eric did do this reading for us as a favor of sorts, and uh, he was so clearly the guy mm -hmm. that we just couldn't get him out of our heads. We had to have Eric. Mm -hmm. And he brought this wonderful urban edginess that I felt was absolutely necessary for this role to really click. Mm -hmm. There were so many factors that went into the casting of, of the character that Eric is playing. Such he needed, as? well, he, he, it's, it's a May-December romance that, that takes place in this We play. should say he's involved with Alicia Silverstone, Alicia Silverstone, and she's Silverstone. quite younger than he is. Yes, yeah. she is. Yeah. And it was very important in creating that relationship on stage that it not be something distasteful in any way. Mm -hmm. And there's a real chemistry between them that is loving and not, at, not remotely lewd. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're attracted to each other on stage, and there's a wonderful chemistry that takes hold. You certainly buy it. You completely buy it. And, and also because I think Eric is verbal and witty and I think it just it suits the role of Richard so well that you, you just believe that he is this Menchie New York photo editor. That and Alicia Eric, Silverstone's going to fall in love that, with. That's that got to feel pretty good. Fall for and you've been playing this urban edgy guy on Law and Order for several seasons I do have to say. Yes, I, I, I it, you know, it's f just footnote, I am known for playing edgy New York City Jewish guys and I am a suburban guy from Massachusetts who was an altar boy at my Christian Armenian church Don't growing tell up. Them. Well, well, then where and, did you get that Bogosian voice? I mean, uh, uh, that in your writing that you brought to you first in your well, performance you know, art. It's pretending. I mean, I think, I think pretending to be the person that you're most unlike, I mean, particularly when I I've sort of made my bones playing very dastardly. I mean, the last character I played before this was Satan uh, in that <laughs> labyrinth, and uh, pretty successful at doing that. Yeah. So that, but, I mean, the whole point is, is that I'm playing the guy that's the, not like me. Right. Um, but there's all sorts of challenges that are always presenting themselves to actors, and I, I always want to remain teachable. In fact, I think one of the big reasons I wanted to do this play was was to learn some new things that I, I wanted to learn to listen a little bit more, and I wanted to step up my game, which I thought definitely uh, working with Dan and Laura was going to uh, do that for me, st be in my good best behavior and really focus, um, mm -hmm. all those things. But uh, And one of the other challenges was to dance a little closer to my self, something that I, that I have pretty much avoided as an actor because I don't I don't know. I'm not interested in selling myself to the, to anybody. I don't care whether people ID me with my characters or not. I just want to fantasize. I want to go off into another mm -hmm. world with my characters. But this was a kind of a challenge, you know. And I, and you know, one night we were walking off stage, and I said to Alicia, you know, I do something in this show that I don't think I've ever done on stage in New York, and that and, and she knew what it was. I smile. I smile a lot with genuine joy. Getting back to the play, I'm mm -hmm. struck by something. Um, that reminds me of Dinner with Friends, your play about two marriages. Mm -hmm. One um, one couple's getting divorced, and the other it forces the other couple to examine the marriage. That there's a similar construction here, is there not? You've got Laura Linney's character, Sarah, the mm -hmm. war photographer. Brian Darcy James, her boyfriend who becomes her husband. He's right. a kind of a war correspondent. They come together in a marriage at the same time that Alicia Silverstone's character and Eric's character come together. Mm -hmm. So we get to see two people trying to make their way in the married world. Y yes, I mean, there is that, there is the, the, the <laughs> dinner with friends paradigm, if you will, is these two couples. Mm -hmm. uh, this play, I think, is as much about marriage as dinner with friends is about marriage. Um, I, you know, I, I like to raise the stakes and, and present contrasts so that, yes, you know, Eric's and Alicia's characters are um, at a very different stage of their romance than Laura and Brian's characters are. They have been through hell together, literally. literally yeah. And they've been together for a long time. And well, for them, I think it's eight and a half years when the play begins. And there's a, Eric's and Alicia's relationship is still very new and very hot mm -hmm. and, uh, and full of optimism. And you know, I just think in terms of being a dramatist wanting to raise the stakes, putting these people together in a room gives me stuff to play with. Mm -hmm. And I can play with the themes of the play, which for me, the play is as much about 
marriage over a period of time as it is about you know photojournalism and and ethics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting but when it comes to the photojournalism and ethics which is a fascinating aspect of the play i was saying to you before that i saw the play the day before the haiti earthquake mm -hmm. and although you're talking about the ethics of journalists in iraq we certainly had this brought up uh, uh, with haiti right. uh, uh, journalists who go to capture the moment and yet then are not helping that they're they're observing the moment but being distant when maybe people are or in despair. journalists who become the story that mm -hmm. they're telling mm -hmm. who enter the picture who break the frame and enter and, the picture. and 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 I remember the next day thinking about your play and watching Haiti thinking what is Al Roker doing in Haiti yes. mm -hmm. <laughs> you know <laughs> How can that help anybody? Yeah, but to be fair to the journalists, they go where the story is. Yeah. And yeah. that was where the story of the day was taking place. And it was an enormous story with so many potential human, uh, human stories to, to tell against this enormous catastrophe to try to make it particular and specific. And I think that's what you know, Laura's character in the play is, is struggling to do, is taking these vignettes, these frozen moments, hence the title, mm -hmm and tell stories to the world at large who might not otherwise stop and think about it. But you get people. into a very interesting issue that your character has to deal with at the magazine. When you have these journalists who go into these places, who want to show the world this genocide, the mm -hmm. butchery, the horrible things that happen, you're dealing with a magazine, you're the photo editor of a magazine, and you have a sort of a wonderful scene where you're fighting for um, the piece from your war correspondent's friend, some um, genocide somewhere in the world um, and you can't get it in because you got to deal with the Hollywood issue the celebrity issue the celebrity culture that has taken over even some of our great magazines mm -hmm. and pushed the seriousness out mm -hmm. well it, and and the argument is beautifully set up and and set spinning by Donald and the audience gets to participate in it Kathy Ryan from the New York Times Sunday magazine came by and she wrote to me afterwards and said that she was she was just jumping out of her skin watching that particular scene because she's been there so often mm -hmm. where uh, she has to choose between this and this or she has to tell somebody that their their piece has gotten bumped or their work has gotten bumped I mean that's that's the joy of this play is that it's genuine drama which I happen to feel is a dying breed in our American theater today, i.e. a play about relationships and their changing relationships, which is what I go to watch, and that's also what I want to play when I'm in a play. And then set on top of this are all these, uh, these uh, wonderful turning arguments about all of these issues that you guys have just been uh, discussing. My kids came, and they really like, when I say kids, they're, they're 18 and 22, and they said, uh, it's great, they, he's not preaching at us, he's not mm -hmm. telling us. They do not want to go see stuff that's serious, that's going to tell you, you know, go feel guilty about this tonight. I mean, who wants to do that? It's, in fact, it's dis that's discussed in the play as well. Yes. <laughs> who wants to go to a play to see, as, as, uh, <laughs> as Alicia says, I love musicals, why would anybody go to the theater to be depressed? That gets a yeah. very <laughs> unsettlingly <laughs> large laugh every night. At the play. But of course, we're not depressed watching this play, and I, and I really have to commend Donald in that these are extremely serious topics about things that are happening with us right now that we must address and be politically responsible to the fact that we are running two or three wars currently. And yet, there's, it's hard to put that up in a theater because the audience is going to say, I don't, you know, I should see that play, but I don't, it's going to be depressing. So what Donald's done is he's tricked people into going to the theater, they get to hear all this stuff, and get to watch all this uh, relationship stuff going on and laugh too and I am saying I am saying go see the play <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I really have to admire it I mean because as a writer I sit there puzzling over these things I want to figure out how to get people to be uh, drawn into something that is serious and at the same time you know that look it's entertainment you pay your money, you have to, you don't want to go to the theater and have it be work. I was going to ask you as a writer, do you ever sort of when you were working on the play, do you think, mm, I wonder if he might let me sort of uh, tackle that scene a little bit or... or there was a little bit of that. We had a tiny, tiny bit, but you know, honestly, it is just, I, I need to stay in the how do I interpret the writer's words. And that in, it just involves a different part of my brain. I mean, there probably are different parts to the brain. And all I'm doing is how, how do I uh, fully inhabit this guy? 
and really, and I'll look at it from that perspective. Right. I won't, why do I say this here? You know, mm -hmm. when do you say there was a little bit of that though? What, what, what do you no, mean? No, no, no. Eric thinks like a writer, but he is an actor. You know, he, he's he's wired mm. to be a, to be a. You see, the thing about writing that I think a lot of people don't understand that it is improvising. Mm. We're improvising with ourselves. You know, you create character A, and character A says something, and then you think, well, what would character B say? Mm -hmm. And it becomes this kind of interplay. But I think, you know, Eric has this uh, innate sense of improvisation. I think it's just because his mind works so quickly. So that the kinds of suggestions that he made were writerly suggestions. For not example? so much. Well, you know, I'm thinking of um, your suggestion of transposing two lines. That was the biggest one. That was that probably the one. That was the one I'm the most proud one. of. It was probably the only really. Good but line. it was really good. Can you sort of tell us what happened? Well, we... there were two lines that, that Eric, you could, you could probably describe. I'm, I'm describing that. what my life was like after I started to get involved with Alicia. And I say I, it was like going from, well, it's like going from black and white to color. Mm -hmm. It was like being in East Berlin when the wall came down. Originally, the, the, the East Berlin <laughs> metaphor came first. Yes. And I just, one day by accident, it actually flipped the other way. And I said, that's actually should be the way because the metaphor is getting more complex. Yes. And also, I can set up the second one. The audience is going to get the black and white to color, right? right. Well, there's nothing really funny about that, but now I can, and that's what I do. I come out there and I sell the wall yes. and the wall coming down every night and, and, I'm very and I get a laugh on it. <laughs> it's true. It's that is a very writerly thing, and it, yeah. it's actually better by flipping it. It, better. it makes it, it makes the the, the, the the little joke yeah. there ki kind of work. No. But everything everything is being invented uh, out of whole cloth by Donald in the first place. And one of the amazing things about theater is you go into rehearsal and you start finding out what's working, not working. Then you get in front of a live audience. I mean, every night is a is an event between us and the audience, and every night's going to be a little different. And that's. Theater is not the written play, and it's not a film of the play, and it's not any other. For, it's it's that thing that happens on that That's night right. that you're part of. Yeah, it's and, a, and it's a it's a living, breathing thing. There's something uh, again. The, uh, one of the things I love about your writing that you touched on earlier, you could go to see a play about a war correspondent. We've seen plays about the war in Iraq, mm -hmm. the war in Afghanistan. I've seen them, and you go in knowing. The playwright is generally going to have a New York City urban NPR view, mm -hmm. the war is bad. Mm -hmm. There was a whole spate of those plays. But you, I think, are the closest contemporary writer we have to Shaw, who gives you one argument from a character, and that you think that's the argument, that's it. And then you bring the other character in, who gives you a completely different argument, and suddenly you can feel the audience sort of say, well... I may not have agreed with that point of view, but there's something to it. Mm -hmm. This is something you seem conscientiously to do in the plays. Well, yeah. I, well, as a playwright, I, I, I don't have answers. But what I try to do is create stories uh, that enable me to dramatize the problem mm -hmm. so that people are arguing but not coming to conclusions. And that's, you know, that's one of the, the pleasures for me in hearing and seeing an audience's response is to see how their, their alliances shift from one line to the next. You know, that, ah, uh, ooh, ah, uh, you know, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> and it's, it's great because it is a kind of tennis match. You know, you're, you're seeing one volley and one response, and, and there's, there's something, it makes the audience participate in a way. It's not, it, it, the audience is not being fed it keeps a them point on their of toes. view. Absolutely keeps them on their toes. We just have a few minutes left. I, we can broaden the discussion out about the sort of the state of playwriting mm -hmm. and the theater now, since you've been teaching playwriting at Yale for 20 years, and you go to the theater pretty regularly in the town, I think. And do a lot of playwriting. You were just saying mm -hmm. that you're, you're, you like this play because it's so different from what you're normally seeing now. There's a, a lack of what is missing in our theater today. Well, I just, there has been the rise lately, for better or for worse, of more schematic plays where the characters that are inhabiting the plays live, and I don't want to be specific because then I would be, that would be me being critical of some of the stuff that's being written, but the characters are more two-dimensional. And, and, and then they just get put into motion, and the audience finds that enjoyable, but they kind of know the way it's all going to work. Uh, drama in the sense of the traditional dramas that we love and revere is is about subtext. The subtext is so deep and rich in this play that I haven't, I don't feel I've really mined it all uh, mm -hmm. yet. And so there's, uh, I don't know, that's that's what I and go to the theater for. That's what the, the, the whole inhabitation of the characters and our identity with them. You know, the hardest thing to write 
in the theater today is to write a play set in our contemporary time with people like us. Because when the audience sits there, their BS meter can tell whether it, this is real or this isn't real. That's right. These people that Donald almost exclusively writes people who are our contemporaries yeah. Yeah. and our colleagues, our peers. So obviously if I write a play about something that's set in Southeast Asia in some backwater village, it, it may be very charming, but I have no idea how they live there, so I don't know whether it's true or it's not true. <laughs> and, and this is the kind of theater I'm very, very interested in because it makes the, the going to the theater becomes a forum for us to look at ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I alluded earlier before we even went on the air that this play isn't always about what it appears to be about. It is about war journalism, but it's also about the way that we are interacting with each other professionally and personally today. How our lives as professionals and as friends become intermingled in a way that you can't, uh, it's, it can be problematic. I'm giving a toast one minute with tears in my eyes about these folks and then five minutes later I'm putting the screws to the guy when he's gonna make the deadline on, yeah. a, on an assignment and and that's the world I live in yeah. That's the world you live in that's the world we live in <laughs> right. and, and, and that's why I want to see a drama about that it's interesting about you, I think about it, you always you do write about contemporary issues of people frequently 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 and yet we see over and over again this absolute craze of revivals Mm -hmm. That uh, seems to have taken over. Is it that the people running the theaters today are afraid, reluctant to put new work on because maybe it won't go since it's a new play? Are we talking about Broadway now? Yeah, or? Broadway, yeah. even the re even a lot of the nonprofit theaters. I mean, I'm yeah. delighted that Manhattan Theater Club is doing Time Stands Still, a new play. But I mean, you know, they've had. But a then they're doing collected stories. I, well, <laughs> it's a <laughs> <wildly> <laughs> season. But we've had a long run of revival after revival after revival. That's got to mm -hmm. be a little discouraging for people who are writing new plays. Well, y yes, it is. But I mean, I think it's also important. If we had a national theater, yep. the way England has a national theater, these the the great plays would be routine. Uh, you know, what's happened now on Broadway is that, you know, they're all star driven. I think it's great, you know, that, that, you know, Hugh Jackman and Daniel Craig were able to pack them in. That's great. But the people came to see Daniel Craig and Hugh Jackman. They didn't the come to see. The play is almost immaterial. It is almost immaterial. It becomes simply a vehicle for celebrity. Mm. I have nothing against these guys. But I do think that people want to see recognizable faces and they want recognizable texts. You know, the musicals that, that, that proliferate now are all based on movies. Yeah. So people going into it know exactly what they're going to see. Maybe they'll get to hum something going out that they just picked up. But they, there are no surprises. No risks. No risks involved. You know, and I think that's certainly true of producers, that there's no risk involved if you're going to do something based on even a marginal, marginally successful film. There is a certain amount of recognition, brand recognition. That will get you your audience. This is the end of this is the end of theater, though. It's not theater you know, never ends. It, it, <laughs> no, it I, is I, primal. I, you know, the, the death of theater has been talked about for That's so true. long, and here we are, we're still standing. And just we and get new, and there's good new plays. Young kids doing stuff that is happening all over the city that is extremely exciting and fun. And uh, if you bother to sniff it out, you'll find all kinds of wonderful <laughs> theater. That and from those people, you know, I'm hoping we're going to see Adam Rapp's plays on Broadway in a couple of years or whatever. It's it, it it's it's always you just can't predict where it's going to go. Well, that's so, true. <laughs> Eric, do you have a new play in the works? Oh, I've got all sorts of little plays and things there. I've been writing books as well. So I had a new book come out last What's spring uh, a called Perforated uh, yes, yeah, Heart, that's, that's quite a good, novel yeah. Simon Schuster, and that that did very well. Uh, all of a sudden, a play will decide it needs to be written, and then I'll sit down. And my last play was uh, with the New York Stage and Film at Vassar last year. So, uh, I don't know. Um, I have such a good time acting. I have to say, it's like um, the, the, it's like a vice for me, and it just it <laughs> pulls me in, and then I don't want to do anything else. Well, I must I say, my, my favorite play of yours, uh, Suburbia, which should be revived somewhere. I think that's a that's a good play. Remember that play, Suburbia? Yes, and Eric revised it. There, you was, there was a revival yeah. uh, oh, a couple of years ago. But at you Second updated Stage. the script. I updated. I'm always updating. Uh, uh, there's a story of, uh, t I think, Tennessee Williams writing uh, something. Uh, was it Tennessee Williams? And he was rewriting a short story, and his, his boyfriend came over and said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm rewriting this. He said, 
that was published two weeks ago in the New Yorker. He goes, yes, but it's not finished. <laughs> and um, that's it. You know, just why not? Yeah, just keep it, keep writing, keep doing until <laughs> well, it gets done. <laughs> the play is *Time Stands Still*, a terrific new play by Donald Margulies at the Samuel Friedman Theater. That's right. Uh, which is part of the Manhattan Theater Club on Broadway. Uh, with a terrific performance by Eric Bogosian. Thanks a lot, guys, for being our guest tonight on Thank the Thanks talk. for having us. Appreciate Thanks it. A lot. Is he dead? Not yet. He's in shock. He died a few minutes later. Great shot. Thanks. How can you be so. Um, what? That poor little boy. Maybe if she took him to the hospital instead of taking his no, picture. There were, there were rescue workers yeah. for that. How could you just stand there? I wasn't just standing there. The boy was dying. No. He was dying. The boy no. would have died no matter what I did. And I wouldn't have gotten the picture. You could have been helping them. I was helping them. I was taking their picture. How is that helping them? By gathering evidence to show. If it weren't for people like me, the ones with the cameras, who would know? Who would care? Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>